Item 5 in the order paper, uh, we come to now the adjournment. The proposer of the talk, topic will have 15 minutes, and all other speakers will have approximately five minutes. I call uh, Ms Jennifer McCann. Good Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I very much welcome the opportunity to um, open today's adjournment debate and to raise the important issue of community-based um, education and alternative education in West Belfast. I'd like to firstly begin by saying that while this debate uh, is about ensuring that the necessary resources are directed into community-based education, it is also um, to, to sort of set the, out the stall for that uh, community-based education and alternative education to be actually recognised for the valuable asset that it is, um, and be given the recognition that it is a service, a quality service that actually promotes academic achievement and develops a person's skill set. Uh, I know there has been some debate in the House uh, in recent months, um, and I don't have to really, um, you know, labour the point here. But there is a view, um, particularly within local communities and those organisations and those sectors that actually deliver community-based education, um, that the, the education uh, is, is basically disappearing, if you like, in a, in when it's uh, being delivered in a locally-based uh, setting. And I think, really, for me, um, the, the, the people seem to see the, the higher and the further education colleges being, um, you know, the, 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 where, if you like, the, the, the services are being directed and people are being directed to, um, should they choose to, to uh, go, go down that route. But for me, it's, it's, it's not just about choice. It is also about meeting the individual needs of the student. And that, those needs can be, can be very sort of um, different in each case. But certainly, um, the individual needs of the student needs to be given priority in this case. I think that some people, we do have to, to say, do in fact prefer to go to a further or higher education college, um, and really, you know, that, that's their choice. But a lot of people that I have spoken to, a lot of people that I know, constituents of mine in West Belfast, have also um, uh, put forward the view that they still want to study and train in a more localised uh, setting and in a more familiarised setting that has more support networks there for them, if you like. And I think that, that when, you know, I, I would ask, you, I would ask uh, uh, members to sort of look at the issue from just imagine someone who has been away from education or training for a long time, an adult returner, for instance. And sometimes it's very, very hard just to take that first step, you know, to go to, to say to, you know, I want, to, I want to, to do further education, I want to do further training. And, you know, they don't really want to go to a big college you know, and maybe that's based in the centre of, of a city or a town. Um, they want to go somewhere where they can feel, you know, that, that they're encouraged and they're supported. And you have to look at sometimes the confidence levels of some of those people that are, are returning to education and training after a long time. So I think there has to be some sort of strategic thinking um, when we look at this, because also what is happening in local community-based education projects is they're being downgraded as well. Not only are they being starved of, of funding, they are also being starved of you know, being able to, for instance, in, in some of the women's centres, we can only do a, a level one qualification. And that actually hinders um, that learner's progress and progression you know, whenever they, they want to go on to, to do further courses and that. So again, I think that we need to have a strategic view of this and we need to look at it in the round and in a holistic way and not just in, in a, a sort of PC bit, if you like. Um, I also want to say that, that again, you know, that uh, women returners particularly can be impacted by this. And, you know, I speak to, to women returners all the time, particularly um, women who have young children and dependents. And again, those, uh, they used to be able to, to take these courses in women's centres, which were locally based centres, easy to get to for, for those, those women, but also the, their children could avail of a crash facility on site which meant if they were doing a class in a particular women's uh, centre, then they could leave their children in the creche, which was in that building as well. And therefore, they could content themselves better to go you know, into, into that class and into that programme of learning because they knew their, their child was getting well looked after and if anything was wrong, you know, the, the, that they would be there um, to, for, for their child. So again, you know, I think that provision uh, in women's centres is very, very important. 
And I think that, that again, you know, um, whenever we're, we're looking into this, we, we need to ensure that you know, by not having those community-based education programmes, we can in fact be excluding some people, um, possibly some very vulnerable people, from access in education and training. But we also can be excluding people that are, you know, who just don't have any other ways of their, their children being minded except in, in a crash facility. Um, and I know many places right across West Belfast that due to cuts in resources and funding that they've had to withdraw the type of provision that they had previously provided in those type of centres. Um, I just want to concentrate also in terms of alternative education. And again, you know, I know that there are a number of alternative education providers right across West Belfast. I want to particularly uh, single out uh, one provider that I have worked with for, for, for a number of years and who have actually been in the West Belfast, uh, based in West Belfast for over 25 years now, and that's New Start Education Centre. And again, you know, alternative education centres prote uh, provide a particular service um, that, that actually, you know, for vulnerable young people, and sometimes that can be a lifeline for those vulnerable young people and their families, because they just, they just don't, you know, help to educate the, the, those children and young people. They actually encourage them, they gain confidence in, in those settings, and they actually go on to achieve educational, um, you know, attainments that they, they probably wouldn't have in, in other settings. And I know, and I'm, I want to really make this point now, obviously, the best option for all children and young people is to be educated through mainstream school provision. And no one here wants to try and argue with that. But there's always going to be that you know, smaller group of children and young people, for whatever reason, that they aren't suited to that mainstream uh, education. And I, I feel, again, going back to it, their needs have to be met as well. We can't marginalise people and we can't you know, exclude people because they're not with, 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 with the bigger group. And New Start Education Centre, as I said, work with young people who, for whatever reason, have fallen out of mainstream education. And they support and encourage that young person to believe in themselves. And that's very, very important because they, they believe in themselves and they can believe then what they, they can achieve, their, the potential that they have. I am a firm believer that all our children and young people have potential. They have talents, they have skills. And I think that given the opportunity, you know, they will shine. And I think that some of our young people need to, need to get you know, a wee bit more, a leg up if you like, a hand up and a wee bit more encouragement than some of, the, some of our other children. And, and to me, it's the most marginalised and the most vulnerable that New Start Education Centre actually provide for. And I've seen, as I said, many, many young people go through New Start. I've spoken to many of their families in, in the years of existence that they've been there. And really, you know, they help them at a vulnerable time in their lives. And I have to say, it's also very cost effective because community-based education and alternative education can actually work out cheaper when it's based in the local community than some of the statutory provision. And I think that, again, this, and I emphasised that at the beginning, this isn't just all about funding. It's about recognising, you know, the, the, um, the difficulties that are there for some people. Certainly. Yeah. And, and again, for bringing uh, this subject to the floor, and uh, uh, the, 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 the minister knows that uh, we have raised uh, the, the, this subject a number of times about funding cuts. Uh, that there are, there are quite a number of groups, in, in, including New Start, that firmly believe uh, that, uh, that the, the, the funding cuts and the redirection of what they see of education away from community-based action more in the third sector. Uh, is having a detrimental effect on it, and somebody needs to explain to them why uh, the courses that they provided for the most vulnerable or the alternative education projects uh, are, are now being excluded, uh, as far as they're concerned, uh, from providing the type of education that's required to, to allow people to develop. I certainly agree with that, and you know, I do have to say, I mean, I've been involved in, in numerous meetings with the member and other colleagues here from West Belfast um, in particular. You know, um, speaking to different ministers who have responsibility both for further education and education in general, and I think, and also in terms of you know the support mechanisms uh, from the, the other ministers in social development, for instance, the Women's Child Care Fund. You know that, that you know there are issues there around funding, and the issue is that the funding is being directed into the further education colleges, into you know out of community-based education 
out of community-based alternative education and into the statutory provision. And I think that, that what we have to do is to go back to basics here and to see that it doesn't suit everybody to go to those further higher edu education colleges. People who it does suit, fine. Um, you know, and again, as I said, we want to see most children remain in main mainstream education in terms of schools, but there are children, I mean, uh, that it just doesn't suit them, them to be educated in that way. And I've seen, I, I've, known, I've known those children to shine when they get that extra encouragement in some of those alternative education centres. So uh, again, it's about keeping that locally based. But I just want to finish um, by saying, you know, um, that, that again, I would appeal to ministers who have responsibility, to departments, I would appeal to members, you know, to recognise the valuable contribution, as I said, that is made by community-based education and alternative education when it's community-based, particularly in areas such as West Belfast that have, you know, high levels of social and economic deprivation. And, you know, we don't want to be excluding people from, from educating themselves. We don't want to be excluding people from going on and training and, and, and getting a better skill set. And, you know, because that, 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 that's, that's a route out of poverty for people, you know, for families and everything else. So I think that it's very, very important. But we need to ensure, and I would appeal again to those ministers that have responsibility, to ensure that they are properly resourced and funded. Because, again, we need to be delivering the, uh, the services effectively and that nobody, nobody at all should be disadvantaged or excluded from those services. So I would appeal for those community-based services to be resourced in the way that they should be and deserve to be. Thank you. I call Alex Atwood. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I thank uh, Ms McCann for uh, bringing this matter to uh, the floor of the Assembly and uh, for the Minister uh, attending and replying to the debate. Um, for me, it comes down to uh, the reason why this motion is important and the reason, reason why the policy intention behind the motion is important comes down to two important streams. The first is that uh, there are many communities in uh, Northern Ireland um, and in, uh, acutely in West Belfast where the richness and strength of the place comes from the richness and strength of its community life. If you look across West Belfast, this is not selective to any one part of West Belfast, but if you look across West Belfast, perhaps as much as anywhere and more than most areas, there is a richness in terms of its community life. And you can see that expressed in sporting organisations, not least the GAA, in campaigning organisations, in terms of all sorts of a lobby and advocacy groups on behalf of the community. And that richness and diversity has many reasons, one of which is that uh, after partition, the state denied to people in areas of Northern Ireland, not least in West Belfast, what it was entitled to. And as a consequence, the culture of the community became that it needed to organise and most organise in a democratic way in order to make demands of the state, in order to ensure that its needs were met. Um, but the richness of the community life in West Belfast is one of the reasons why alternative approaches to provision of public services, be it education or otherwise, is actually a particularly vibrant and viable way in order to deliver public policy. And I want to stress that this is not particular to one part of West Belfast. The, the work that is going on on the Shankill or in Suffolk, uh, areas that are unionist in terms of their political tradition, and the leadership at a community level across the delivery of public services in those areas as much as in other parts of West Belfast is quite remarkable. The second reason why the motion is important and why the emphasis upon alternative and community-based education is important is because of the profile of need in West Belfast. The proper points made by Jennifer McCann about people who are outside the life of institutions, including education institutions, means that they require and they are better enabled to access public services, not least education, through community-based and alternative models. And you can see that across the delivery of public sector 
uh, services in West Belfast. But it has become, uh, it remains a necessary means of delivery because nearly 20 years since the Good Friday Agreement and nearly 10 years after restoration of devolution, the lowest life expectancy in Northern Ireland is in West Belfast, where the uh, average life expectancy of uh, male uh, persons is, is um, 74.1 years and of females 79.8 years. These are the worst figures in Greater Belfast when it comes to life expectancy. When it comes to child poverty, 39% of children in West Belfast are in child poverty. Uh, the average across Northern Ireland is 21.4, and that figure is worsening in all parts of Northern Ireland, and is going to worsen between now and 2020, when the average in Britain is 18.2%. In West Belfast, the number of people on age 18 to 24 on Job Seekers Alliance is 9%, again the highest in Northern Ireland, where the average is 6%. And this is crucial to the points that Jennifer McCann were making uh, 20 years after the Good Friday Agreement. The, people, the number, percentage in West, of people in West Belfast uh, coming out of school that have no qualifications is 38.1%, again the highest in Northern Ireland. So the profile of need of people who want public services or are seeking educational advancement in West Belfast is as acute as it ever was and is acute across all indicators of life expectancy, child poverty, people coming out of school going into, onto JSA, and people with no qualifications uh, whatsoever. And that profile requires the bespoke approach to address the need. And the bespoke approach, uh, Mr. Deputy uh, Speaker, is not just the institutional mechanisms of delivery, but the community and alternative-based mechanisms of delivery. Because this move towards delivery through the institutions, and I want to recognise that there are great schools in West Belfast and there is good delivery of FE, but the profile of need requires an alternative approach and a complementary approach, and that approach across public services, not, G, not least education, is through the alternative and community-based one. I call Andy Allen. Deputy Speaker. At the outset, I would like to declare an interest as a voluntary trustee of an organisation which provides community-based training to an organisation. And I have seen and witnessed firsthand the, the good that it can do for individuals who, for whatever reason, um, prefer to be, uh, carry out education in a community-based environment, and they do strive at it. As an MLA, though, for representing the east of the city, I do slightly hesitate speaking on a debate concerning the constituency of West Belfast. However, I did in the recent past in the Ulster Unionist Party office in West Belfast. So I am familiar with this part of the city. I also have some personal experience of alternative education, which I, sh well, I will share a little later. This debate will be worthwhile if it raises the level of public consciousness of the existence of community and alternative education. According to a research paper compiled last January by the excellent Assembly Research Team and Information Service, there are 32 facilities offering some type of education other than the school across Northern Ireland. From a look at the list, a disproportionate number of those are based in the West Belfast area. Examples are the Conway Education Centre, situated on the interface between the Falls Road and the Shankill Road, Open Doors, Barrick Street, and Pathways, which has three sites, including on the Shankill. This is to name just three providers, but there are others serving a very useful purpose in society. So what is community and alternative-based education? It is, it is a fact that a percentage of our population, for whatever reason, just do not fit in and do not thrive in the setting of formal education, schools, or colleges. This is where alternative education can fill a gap. According to the Department of Education, 
education other than at school provides education for children with social, emotional, behavioural, medical or other issues who cannot otherwise access suitable education. It allows children who have been expelled or suspended from their school or have otherwise disengaged with it to participate in education until they achieve a new school place, until they, prepare, until they are prepared for re-entry to an existing school place, to maintain their education until compulsory school leaving age. Clearly those who provide community or alternative based education work in a very challenging environment. They attempt to re-engage a considerable number of disaffected, disaffected young people in academic or vocational education. The inspections carried out by the Education and Training Inspectorate show that most young people leave the projects with some degree of qualification. For example, the Conway Centre provide learning opportunities to adult learners, young people between ages 14 and 16, and primary school age children. It is also an improved examination centre, facilitating a wide range of exams to external clients. According to its website, Conway engages over 800 individuals a year in education. Its youngest learner is eight, and the oldest is 81. Another example I have mentioned is the Open Doors Learning Centre, which caters for 14 to 16 year olds. This centre draws in young people from all quarters of Belfast on a cross community basis, offering flexible curriculum with both academic and vocational routes in an information informal setting, but within a full time timetable. As I said earlier, I have some experience of this. It's no fault of my own. When I was in year 11 uh, in school, I didn't thrive at school. I, I actually didn't like it, didn't want to be there. And I found myself drifting upon a path that I didn't want to go, but it was unavoidable. The, the school, my, my current school, and an alternative education setting got together and, and they looked at what they could do for me. And I attended the Link Centre, which is also the Open Doors facilities also there. And it was in that setting that I was able to thrive. It was a relaxed, it was a casual setting, but I was able to gain computer skills. I was able to gain skills that allowed me to go on in, in a further career path. But what it did for me, it, it settled me down. It gave me a, a understanding of academics and the need to learn and the need to thrive at school. And with the help and support of the staff in the Link Centre, who I must pay tribute to, Laurie Burns, who does a terrific job. Um, you know, without them, I, I don't know where I would have ended up. I really don't. And they do a tremendous job. And, and once again, I would like to pay tribute to them. There are many proven successful community and alternative education projects in West Belfast and right across Northern Ireland. We often speak in this place about the importance of education. We have regular reports about underachievement and the connection between poor attainment and poverty. It is right that the work of the community and alternative education sector is praised and highlighted. You cannot talk of community education in West Belfast without mentioning the work of other, over many decades of Jackie Redpath on the Shankill. The Greater Shankill Children and Young People Zone deserves the support of all Stormont departments, not just education. It is essential that in these uncertain times of financial cutbacks and questionable budget, budgetary decisions, that this, this vital work receives adequate resources from the Department of Education. I thank the proposer of the motion for bringing this issue to this, the attention of the Assembly. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Rosie McCorley. Um, I am very happy to um, speak in this debate today and I'm, I wish to um, thank my colleague Jennifer McCann for bringing the debate to the floor of the Assembly today. And uh, a, a lot of very valid and important points have already been made, so I, I don't wish to rehearse all of that again. Uh, the, the arguments, I believe, have been well made, so I will just add some remarks of my own. And it's, it's to say that not everyone has enjoyed a positive experience in mainstream education, and a lot of adults grew up in the time whenever we didn't have the kind of system of education that we currently have. And, and so people, 
had a short period in education and came out with, with no qualifications, in spite of the fact that people had many talents and many capabilities to offer. So, I mean, it's good today that uh, we have places which offer opportunities for adults to find their way back into adult education. And my, my own mother uh, was someone who, who availed of that. She, uh, di you know, didn't achieve any formal ed uh, qualifications in school, but she uh, went back to adult education and she achieved O levels in English and. Uh, sociology and was very proud of that. So uh, it does wonders for people's self-confidence, and uh, I think it's something very, very positive. And w what it has done is it's uh, it's a unique educational response to the diverse needs of adult learners. And there's a very wide range of people who who avail of adult education. In West Belfast, there's a very rich environment of provision, and we, we have it offered in lots of community organisations like Conway Education uh, Centre, Frank Gillen Centre, Falls Women's Centre, Shankill Women's Centre, Footprints uh, Women's Centre, Beachmount Community Centre, Upper Anderson Sound Community Centre, Lenadon Community Centre, and the Gravener Road Community Centre. And I hope I haven't left anybody out there. Uh, but as you can see, there, there is a, a wide range of providers, and uh, all of those um, providers exist because the need is there, and uh, I mean some of the positive uh, impacts that, that, that it delivers is for the individual. It provides a means of achieving their full potential through developing confidence and skills essential for employability, breaking through isolation, maintaining good mental health, nurturing creativity and imagination, enhancing family relationships, and enabling civic participation. But it, it's true to say that there are um, very serious issues that face providers. Uh, funding is a big issue, and a lot of their courses would be unaccredited, and so it makes uh, sourcing funding difficult because of that. There's also a lack of uh, firm research, even though the, the uh, informal uh, sort of information and um, data would be there to suggest that there is a real need, uh, that the actual hard uh, research isn't there. Also, there are unnecessarily strict DL requirements. The tutors teaching ESF-funded courses need to have a teaching certificate from Ulster University, so that makes it more difficult um, because there would be the qualified teachers there, but because they don't have the um, specific qualification required, that they, they aren't allowed to um, teach the funded courses. So, uh, I mean, I would just like to outline some of the um, achievements of, of Conway Education Centre as an example of, of what these providers deliver for thousands of adults. In the last five years, 520 people have gained ICT qualifications, 260 have gained essential skills in maths. Um, where's my other page? I've lost my other page. There's a wide, there's a wide range. Uh, oh yes, I have. 73 gained GCSE maths and English. 63 business admin and accountancy. Uh, 1,500 attended unaccredited courses such as baking, gardening, digital photography, Irish language, local history, etc. And approximately 30% of those attending unaccredited courses progressed to participation in an unaccredited in an accredited course within 12 months. So you can see that by an encouraging people in and creating that facility, uh, people all seem to progress to uh, a more formal style of education, if that's their choice. Um, there, a document um, called Belfast, a learning city, uh, in this document, Eddie Rooney stated that lifelong learning plays a powerful role in creating a more equal, just and inclusive society. Lifelong learning needs to be tailored to the needs of all. So, I mean, that's a very um, formal and a very um, informed statement on, on the, the need and of the, uh, the shape of, of adult education and, and how it needs to um, be there to support the people that need that. So uh, w one final point I would like to make is the, um, the, uh, w what it does to people with mental health issues. And there is, in, there is uh, information which, which tells us that um, 
it, it's benefits. It's of great benefit to people with um, mental health issues and uh, people who suffer from uh, other other um, conditions such as depression and isolation. So, I mean, there are very many positive reasons why why that we, we, we should continue to support and fund uh, adult education. Gora Mayogut. I call on the Minister for Employment and Learning, Dr Stephen Farry, to respond. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I, first of all, uh, thank the um, mover of the motion and also uh, recognise all of those who have contributed uh, to the debate uh, as well. And in responding, say that uh, I am responding as to obviously the Minister for Employment and Learning, but the issue itself, uh, indeed as many of the speakers have recognised, cuts across the rules of a number of departments. Can I also recognise the importance of education in, in its own right um, for a number of reasons, the importance of empowering individuals uh, in terms of creating that sense of, of, of uh, opportunity and also their own stake uh, within uh, society and their own sen sense of worth and, and, and respect, and also the wider benefits that accrue to society and, and the economy. Uh, and in doing so, also recognise the other um, positive social benefits that uh, we can achieve through encouraging people to reach their potential in terms of, of education, uh, including, uh, for example, uh, reduced uh, dependency in terms of the health service. And we appreciate the, the pressure points that, that, are, that uh, other aspects of our public services are experiencing. So, investment in education has many benefits uh, across uh, society as a whole, and it is important that we do. Uh, empower every individual to reach their, their full potential. And in doing that, we have to uh, ensure we are, that we are providing the range of provision uh, that will uh, identify and respond to the very particular uh, requirements of different cohorts of learners. And in saying that, I do recognise, therefore, the importance of community-based education and how it can uh, address uh, the, the needs of those uh, learners who have some particular barriers uh, to uh, engaging in education and training. And in, in, in doing that as well, to recognise that often the provision that is offered by the community and voluntary sector is better placed uh, to deliver outcomes than some, in some cases the formal statutory provision that would be offered uh, by, by the state. But in saying that as well, it is important to recognise that the community-based provision itself uh, has to be viewed as part of an overall system that includes the, the formal strategy school system alongside uh, mainstream further education and also um, higher education. Um, whenever we are looking at the needs of, of learners, uh, we must also recognise that uh, often uh, it is within a community setting uh, that they will um, best uh, be served and uh, get important uh, footholds on the, the ladder of progression. But in saying that, we have to recognise as, as well the importance of um, encouraging progression on the skills ladder uh, into other types of pr provision, and also recognising that mobility itself can be important whenever it comes to employment. Many of the barriers that people are experiencing in relation uh, to employment will often uh, be replicated in terms of barriers that people perceive in, in relation uh, to education. And a number of speakers have made reference, for example, uh, to uh, childcare and other care and responsibilities uh, that uh, may be uh, obstacles. Of course, it is worth pointing out that, uh, that the, further, uh, the further education and higher education systems themselves do offer uh, assistance for students who have uh, particular issues, in including um, around uh, hardship and other particular, uh, particular challenges. Uh, members have also made reference to um, the context in which we are discussing this around um, budget uh, cuts. And not least, uh, the experience of my department over the past number of years has been extremely uh, challenging. Uh, we are seeking to, to see how we can best maximise the effectiveness of the scarce resources available uh, to us and to ensure that we have the biggest impact in terms of what is available to us in terms of achieving uh, outcomes. Um, it's certainly not been my uh, agenda of shifting resources from the community and voluntary sector into the mainstream sector, but rather one of allowing different aspects of that overall system uh, to, to have a degree of greater uh, specialism. Of course, in turn, that does create certain tensions, and obviously those are being articulated today and uh, on other occasions as well. Um, we do have the uh, resource of the European Social Fund uh, available uh, to us, and uh, I always 
would like to start a discussion on the fund uh, by pointing out the opportunity that comes to us uh, in Northern Ireland from our membership of the European Union. And, uh, the European Social Fund is one of many examples uh, of the benefits of Northern Ireland accrues uh, from the UK's ongoing membership of the European Union, particularly at this time uh, when that uh, membership is under uh, such uh, question, questioning and un uncertainty. Um, the fund uh, is designed uh, to allow us to do uh, levels of activity and support levels of activity would, that would not otherwise be the case uh, through the existing uh, departmental uh, budgets. Contrary to perhaps the, the, the public impression and in the context of obviously wider pressures <coughs> excuse me, on the community and voluntary sector, I do want to place on record that, the, that we have not in, in fact cut the European Social Fund. Um, as we stand in terms of the 2014 to 2020 programme, we have a bigger overall package of funding uh, available. And, and, and within that, we also have a greater allocation in terms of match funding. I give my time. And, and I, I understand what you, uh, you're saying and, uh, to, to, to the Chair. And uh, uh, yes, there, there, there was an increase in funding. But there, there, there was a growing belief, for, especially in the women's sector and the alternative education sector, uh, that, uh, that, that they fell foul of new rules and new regulations, and that those who had the wherewithal uh, to be able to put together uh, professional enough applications uh, were the, the, the ones that came through, through in the end. It happened to be uh, in, the, in, the, in the mid-80s, and I know you talk about the structure of uh, community education. I was on the committee of a, an, the, one of the first alternative education projects in Belfast and Davis Flats uh, that, that, that allowed young people to come through who had left or opted out of uh, the formal education project. I've seen in Conway Mill uh, people uh, who uh, would tell you who are teaching, who are lecturers, uh, who are in high paid jobs now, who said that they faced a life on the streets except for that alternative and no amount of going to uh, the, the further education uh, colleges uh, would, have, uh, would have enticed them back into the system that has now given them a life. Well, thank the member for his, for his comments. Can, can I just say, in terms of the, of the premise of the, the importance and relevance of community-based education, I, I, I do fully accept uh, the points that, that he is making. Uh, what has happened in relation to the European Social Fund is, while we do have a bigger uh, overall pot, including a bigger pot in terms of match funding, given that it is a competitive um, process in terms of, of allocations, there will be situations where certain organisations are successful and other, others are unsuccessful in terms of their bids. But I have to say, I don't recognise this characterisation that it is those organisations with um, better infrastructure who are better placed to make bids who have been uh, more successful in this regard. I do believe we have a very re reasonable spread in terms of the types of organisation uh, that we are funding. With the qualification, obviously, certain organisations will be disappointed in terms of, of outcomes. But just to put that in, in context, we have something like 60, 67 different projects underway in terms of the cure, current uh, European Social Fund. Of that, uh, we estimate that 21 currently are operating within the West Belfast um, area. Now, the entirety of community education uh, is not solely dependent upon uh, the European Social Fund. There will be other uh, provision. Indeed, the further education colleges themselves um, have outreach and work, will work with many organisations, including many of the organisations that members have mentioned uh, already. So, the, the, the notion that, the, that somehow there is a, a tension between, on the one hand, the community-based delivery and further education uh, in terms of some sort of polarised choice is, is a false one. Further education itself and members will be aware that we have launched a fresh strategy for further education uh, today and talked within that about the importance of the dual role of the FE sector, both in terms of delivery for the economy of Northern Ireland, but also the, the, the very important social function that they play in terms of inclusion and ensuring that people are given opportunities. And the FE sector itself appreciates the importance of working with, on, a, on a community basis. So mainstream FE is not something that is alien or something different uh, from delivery in terms of communities and responding uh, to communities is, is part and parcel of their, of their DNA as organisations uh, in, in their own uh, particular, particular right. Obviously, whenever we're talking about further education and West Belfast, in addition to community provision, that we have two campuses that fall within uh, the, the constituency itself, obviously with 
Mill Millfield and the E3 campus at, Spring at, Spring at Springfield. So there is good provision in West Belfast itself in terms of further education. And in particular, given that E3 is, is a, a modern in investment, that should be viewed as a huge um, asset. At one level, we have uh, a lot of what our, our current assured skills programme whenever uh, students are being trained uh, to take up opportunities in terms of a number of the inward investment projects. That training is occurring in West Belfast itself, but also E3 is there as a very powerful um, uh, asset in terms of the community itself as, a, as FE provision in, in the constituency. Um, it's also worth, re worth referencing as well that in terms of other aspects of our provision, um, in terms of training for success, we have a number of organisations in, in West Belfast uh, who are currently in, in receipt of contracts, and indeed members will be aware of many of those organisations. We also have a number of, of United Youth projects that are currently working uh, in uh, the West Belfast uh, consistency, including both uh, youth initiatives and uh, in include youth. We do need to be conscious as well about our future provision around uh, uh, those who are not in education, employment and, and training and see how we can further develop the, the pathways uh, strategy. Um, one of my current disappointments as Minister is that we have not uh, been in a position uh, to date that, that we have been able to implement the economic and activity strategy. Uh, that was um, agreed by the Executive in April of 2015. Now, with the reorganisation of departments, that will transfer to the new Department of uh, com Communities. Um, it would be my uh, hope and ambition that uh, a future executive will be able uh, to resource uh, that strategy. Within that, there is scope for competitive pilots happening at a local uh, community ba base. Uh, that um, will be seeking to target particular groups within economic activity. One of those target groups uh, will be those uh, with family and caring responsibilities, the other one being those with uh, work limiting uh, disabilities. Particularly in terms of the first category, a, a large majority of those with caring responsibilities uh, will be women, and I appreciate members have mentioned uh, particular concerns about that uh, particular section of, of, of the community and their ability to, to re engage. So that strategy will be seeking bids coming from community-based organisations around new types of intervention uh, that, may be that may be successful uh, in that particular regard. But in closing, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I do want to, to again thank members for, for their comments. Um, it is important that we do consider community education in the round. We do consider that we have a range of existing uh, provision. Uh, obviously, there are some particular tensions in terms of the way, uh, uh, for example, the European Social Fund is, is being uh, rolled out. We have discussed those centrally as, uh, as an assembly uh, in, in the past, and those comments uh, still stand. Well, it is important that we understand that there are partnerships, uh, and it is important that we see uh, community-based delivery and the further education and higher education, as well as the school system, as being part of an overall system, not something that is there in terms of stark alternatives. Well, it is important that we focus in on the, whatever works best in terms of ensuring that we are delivering uh, the best for individual learners, and that clearly, clearly that includes the delivery through community and voluntary organisations. Members, the question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned.